In this video, we are going to look at the interface between the CPU and memory. The first thing to consider is what is it that is stored in memory? We have two types of objects, instructions and data. And correspondingly, we will look at the instruction memory and the data memory and try to understand how they could be implemented and what functionality is required of them. The first thing we need to understand is an interesting concept called the stored program computer. If you recall, the way that we started with the idea of a processor was to think in terms of a data path and some mechanism for control. In our discussion so far, we know that the ALU or the arithmetic logic unit forms our data path. It's the part that actually does the computations. The control is yet to be implemented. It's part of what we are developing as we move forward. So the first question that then comes up is, okay, the ALU operates on data. Where does this data come from? And a related question is, what about the instruction? What to do with the data? Where does this come from? Assume that you already have some kind of storage mechanism, which we will call a memory store, where we can store data. Data, after all, in our case, would essentially be a set of bits. Now, the interesting twist on this is when once you realize that instructions can also be just viewed as a sequence of bits or can at least be encoded as a sequence of bits. And once you realize that instructions can be encoded as a sequence of bits, they can now be stored in the same memory store as the data itself, or at least a similar kind of memory storage mechanism. Now, this idea of using a memory store in order to hold the instructions is related in some ways to the concept of a universal Turing machine. It's outside the scope of this course, but is a fascinating theory of what is and is not computable. This idea was familiar to John von Neumann from the late 30s, early, early 1940s. And since von Neumann was one of the leaders of the construction of what could arguably be called a modern computer, he strongly promoted this idea of using the stored program concept. One of the major benefits of this idea of a stored program is reprogrammability. It means that we can just have a memory storage and by changing the contents of that memory store, we can also change the way the computer behaves. This has a lot of benefits as we are all familiar with and how it can actually be put to use is something that we will see as we move forward. So let's look at what our processor core is going to look like so far, what we have is an ALU, the arithmetic and logic unit. We already know how that can be implemented. And this communicates with a register file. The idea is that the register file provides the inputs that the ALU needs to operate on. And the output generated by the ALU also goes back into some location in the same register file. Now, how do we decide which registers are to be the inputs to the ALU? And what is the operation? that the ALU needs to perform and what is the desti destination that is where should the output of the ALU go all of these are encoded in some kind of an instruction so an instruction in other words is just a set of bits which we put through a block that we are going to call a decoder which essentially is just some kind of simple control logic that generates the addresses for the register file and the opcode to be fed to the ALU the question is where do these instructions come from and the simplest idea that we can use in this context is to just use a list of instructions an array if we want to think in those terms but ultimately just some kind of a memory store where a set of bits has been stored and groups of those bits can be read out one by one forming the instructions that need to be executed at any point in time what this means is that we can think of a simple memory structure which has sequential addresses as something that can store all the instructions that we want to operate with. And the next question that comes is, how do we decide which instruction needs to be fed to the rest of the processing system at any given point in time? That is controlled by a unit that whose job is only to provide the next instruction address. As we will see later, one way of doing this is to simply have a counter. We just step through sequential set of instructions but by generalizing this idea, we can actually also bring about the idea of branches and thereby 
increase the range of computations that the processor can do. The next question of course is what about the data and the data has two purposes. One is the data coming out of the ALU somehow needs to go into a memory storage. The default of course as shown by the black line is that the data goes back into the register file but there is a possibility that we might decide to take it directly into an external storage instead. In the RISC-V processor this cannot directly be done but there are processors in which this can happen. So from the point of view of a processor architecture this is not undoable. The other thing of course is what else does the ALU need? It needs inputs. Right now those inputs are coming from a register file but we could just as well also take those inputs directly from an external memory. The idea of directly taking data from an external memory and feeding it to an ALU has certain problems primarily to do with the critical path of the system as we will see later and therefore a lot of modern processors and in particular the whole idea of the RISC architecture says that we should never have data directly going from memory into the ALU or from the ALU back out into memory use the registers as a stopover point which means that we can now sit and optimize that path the data to the register and from a register file back to the data memory and the rest of the computations the ALU now has to deal only with the register file itself. This is the architecture that we will be following as we build on the RISC-V processor. Now there are a couple of alternatives that can be followed. One is to use the same memory for data and instructions. This is usually what is referred to as the von Neumann architecture. The same block of memory is used in order to store the data and the same memory is also used in order to store the instructions. On the other hand, another kind of architecture uses completely different memory blocks. There is an instruction memory and a data memory. This is usually called the Harvard architecture since the first sort of major designs that followed this architecture were the result of research at Harvard University. Now modern machines if you think about it they are all they all follow the von Neumann architecture mostly because after all an x86 or a laptop or anything else that you have is very likely going to just talk about something like 4 gigabytes of RAM as the amount of memory that it has. It does not say how much instruction memory or how much data memory it has. The advantage of this structure is that the programs, the operating system, the various different the browser, the editors, all those kinds of things that you use on a regular basis can now use that memory that is available to you. And you do not need while writing the program to separate out what goes into instruction memory and what goes into data memory. It's one unified address space. On the other hand, as we saw in the figure earlier, logically it makes sense to think of these two things as being different. That is to say the instruction memory has a very specific purpose. Only instructions are read from there. Whereas the data memory can be used to read data, write data, and also as some kind of storage just for intermediate computations. And as we will see later in the course, modern machines are sort of a mix of both of these. In principle, they have a single shared memory, but in practice, there are separate caches which effectively form a separate instruction memory and data memory and allow this separate IMEM DMEM architecture to be implemented. There are certain kinds of processors, in particular signal processing applications, DSPs, which explicitly have a Harvard architecture. They have a completely separate instruction memory and data memory, which allows them to perform certain kinds of computations at very high throughput. So if we look at what exactly happens inside a processor, the sequence of steps is something like this, retrieve an instruction, decode it. Is it an ALU operation, a memory access operation, a branch, some kind of specialized operation? And once you have decided what it is, you execute it and essentially repeat the process. Go back and fetch the next instruction. And once again, we go back to the process of decoding and executing. In other words, this is a repetitive operation. If you think in terms of a finite state machine, it would be very simple. It just needs to have one state where it essentially retrieves the instruction, then it decodes and then it executes and goes back to the first state. 
do you really need a finite state machine for this? Does it need multiple clock cycles to execute? Maybe not. We will see multiple different variants of this as we move forward. But the interesting part that we can notice from this is that instruction fetching requires providing an address to the instruction memory. If the instructions to be followed are just stored in sequential order inside the instruction memory, then all that you really need to do is to use a counter. Just a sequential counting, one after the other, fetch the instructions and proceed. But since a counter anyway requires a register to be used, or at least a set of flip-flops, one possibility that we could use over here is have a dedicated register whose default operation is to just increment to the next address and fetch the next instruction. But under certain circumstances, we can just load that register with absolutely any value that we want. This allows us to perform a branch or a jump in the context of a program. And it's a very powerful device that allows us to tremendously increase the computational capability of the processor. This register, of course, is called the program counter and is the key to implementing not just the regular operation of the processor, but also the branching instructions. With regard to fetching data from the main memory, that is the read operations, the address that we want to fetch the data from must ideally be programmable. We do not want to always have to fetch data from a single location in memory after all, which means that I should be able to take any address in principle and load data from there. And the simplest mechanism that we can think of in our present context is why not use one of the registers in the CPU register file for this? After all, it stores a number. Let's treat it as an address and pick up the data from there and somehow get that data back into another register in the CPU. Now, how do we go about this? One possibility, as I mentioned earlier, is that you could read data directly from the data memory all the way into the arithmetic and logic unit. In other words, I could think of an operation such as add mem of 20 with mem of 30 and store the result in mem of 40, where mem of 20 essentially corresponds to fetching data from memory location number 20, mem of 30 would fetch the data from location 30 and store the result in memory location number 40. Is this possible? Yes, in principle there are processors and in fact even the x86 architecture has instructions of this sort. Now having said that it is generally not a good idea. Part of the reason is that because the memory itself is typically outside the main chip that we are designing. It is slower, it's more difficult to access, it consumes more power. So rather than trying to directly access memory and, in, and get the data all the way into the ALU, the other option is to say that we will always force the reading and writing of data to happen from registers in the register file. This is the philosophy employed by RISC. The name RISC essentially has the connotation that it is a reduced instruction set and was clearly brought in to sort of show that it was in some ways better than the other complex instruction set. Having said that, there are a lot of benefits to both. Whereas the name load store architecture is much more accurate. It very clearly says what is the primary philosophy behind risk. It's not so much about reducing the instruction set. It is more about making sure that the critical parts can be optimized by ensuring that you do not have arbitrarily large memory blocks coming into the critical path and thereby making the system slow. What about data output? That is the right operations. Once again, we use the same idea. Let's use one of the register files or perhaps even some part of the instruction in order to uh, determine what the address of the right operation should be. What about the source of the data to be written? Once again, we could have data directly coming from the ALU or another possibility here is that we could also take data directly from one location in memory and write it into another. And in fact, the x86 architecture has certain memory copy instructions which allow you to directly issue one instruction that can copy a byte from one location in memory to another. On the other hand, RISC prevents direct manipulation of data between memory locations and says that anything has to first come into the register file. So to summarize, the CPU core by itself is very limited in its functionality. All that it can do is ALU type operations 
and the register file that is provided is also very limited because it has a small capacity. Typically it is built for 16 or maybe 32 registers. Definitely not more than at most 100 or so. On the other hand, by using the concept of stored programs, we can arbitrarily change the type of instructions that are fed to the processor and also tremendously increase the amount of data that it can operate with. Both instructions and data are stored therefore in this external memory and the result is that we can get computation far more than what would be possible just using the ALU and the register file alone.